Thanks for the invitation uh, to be with you. And um, I decided not to make a presentation on the presentations, yesterday's presentations. So as Sheila mentioned, uh, I'm going to uh, make some reflections and maybe provocations. Uh, because I, I, I think that in addition to the aims uh, <clears throat> posed by uh, Jim and uh, recalled uh, just now by Sheila, we are heading into three main areas, policies, practice, and research. So maybe my reflections will touch on some of these, or perhaps the three of them, policy, practice, and uh, research. And I would lo like to make my reflections <coughs> within three categories, scope, perceptions, and gaps. In this final one, I am not sure whether I'm going to speak about gaps only or what I would call blind spots, which uh, to me is a bit different from a gap, but I'll go into that later. Let me start by t talking about the scope, and I would like to widen the scope of our discussions. We were focused on six approaches yesterday. And uh, I, I think it would be important for us to think of the context where we are discussing these approaches. Let me start by saying that there is a trend now, and you are very aware of that, that we are talking about health as a human right. So I think this, it's important to have that in mind that we are talking about a human right. When we are talking about approaches to equality improvement, it's, just for, it's not just for the sake of improving, but because we are protecting a human right. Second, <clears throat> we are also immersed into what has been the most recent strategy uh, proposed by WHO, Universal Health Qu uh, Coverage. And I have a concern with that, and you may share that with me or not, but uh, my concern is that in that policy, and that, that has been reproduced, by the way, by the Pan American Health Organization here in Washington, the word quality appears only once in the whole document. So it says access to quality services, but they keep talking about access in terms of increasing resources, funding, uh, nurses, doctors, facilities, as if quality would be a given, which we know it's not. And uh, even though they say that uh, they, the, the access should be to quality services, in fact, quality is not present. And what I'm saying, and I said that, to uh, people in PAHO and in uh, WHO, uh, access or accessibility without quality is irresponsibility. So <clears throat> this is the other frame that we have. We are talking about universal health coverage, but we are trying to improve qualities in, in those services uh, because now it's more needed. Again, because accessibility without quality is a responsibility, and we know that very well. And third, in terms of this uh, first reflection on the scope, in addition to uh, being a health, a human right, and to be working on this large framework posed by WHO on, on universal health coverage, uh, I'm concerned that we are talking about low- and middle-income countries as if they were the same, all the same, or at least very similar, which we know it's not the case. I know that most projects that we've been uh, talked about have been working in perhaps in low-income countries, but yet there are differences as well. Let me give you some figures. Uh, the World Bank divides countries in four categories depending upon income. So they have low income countries, lower middle income countries, upper middle income countries, and high income countries. And let me give you just some figures that I'm sure you know, but uh, it's important to remind this. <clears throat> Life expectancy. 
in low income countries is 55 years, in lower middle income countries, 68, and in upper middle income countries, 71. So it's, it's an important difference between low and upper middle. Um, mortality, infant mortality under five years of age in low income countries is 125, 125, lower middle 57, upper middle 22. Or health expenses, $30 per capita in low income countries, $99 per capita in lower middle, and 570 in upper middle countries. Would there be any difference in terms of uh, implementing quality improvement in such uh, different uh, scenarios or not? I am not sure, but I might say maybe, maybe yes. Should we take that into consideration when we are dealing with the questions that we are now about to answer? I think, I think yes. So these are the three scope uh, reflections that I had. But then let me go into perceptions or questions, and then into gaps. Uh, after listening to the very interesting presentations yesterday, let me tell you I wrote almost, well, not almost, uh, 19 pages of notes, because I knew I had to say something this morning. But I ended up uh, trying to say too much with 19 pages, so I decided to pinpoint only 10. Um, perceptions and questions, and 10 gaps. Again, just like shoots to your mind. Um, so to provoke uh, whatever we discuss uh, in our next meetings. Let me start then by some perceptions. <clears throat> the first one, again, what I said, is the same to implement quality improvement uh, strategies in low or in lower middle or in upper middle countries is the same. But then two, I would like to go back to uh, some of the things that as Ashish mentioned yesterday. She said trust is very important. I would like to add an additional reason why this is important. Of course, it's important in terms of better care. Treating patients with uh, dignity is absolutely fundamental in terms of human rights. But let me tell you, uh, and I'm sure you know this, that trust is also important for accessibility. Uh, I've known people that don't want to go to a clinic because they know that they will be almost rejected by the attitude of doctors or nurses, that it's like they don't want them to have, their, to, to, to have them there. So <clears throat> trust is not just a matter of better care, but of access. And if we don't facilitate access, we cannot provide better care. Three, it was clear to me that we are dealing with six separate approaches. But at the end, we are talking about a combination of approaches. Uh, and Alex showed us in a, in a very, very uh, rigorous way how, for example, combining training with supervision is different uh, depending upon the time devoted to training and uh, whether or not that training is uh, superficial or profound. So we know that the interactions between interventions have something to do with the outcome that we achieve. So should we be starting to talk about bundles? And someone mentioned this yesterday, bundles of interventions rather than just one kind of an intervention. Let me tell you that uh, when, when we implemented the, the national strategy in Mexico, we implemented 10 interventions that went from uh, making explicit patient rights and doctor's rights and nurse's rights, passing through accreditation, of course, quality improvement, to citizen participation in quality improvement. 
but we were working with 10 different interventions. And I'm sure that if we would uh, go only for one, we would have not achieved much. So, uh, but that leads me to another reflection. When you are talking about something that Jim said yesterday, we are talking about large scale. He said quality approaches, approaches must be effective in large scale. So when you're talking of large scale, uh, in low and middle income countries, you may be working with governments. And uh, maybe you have no choice other than working with governments that are responsible for such a large scale intervention. Now, my question in the past months, because I've been thinking of this, and, and Sheila and I have talked about this several times, and we cater as well, uh, is the sum of individual qualities equal to the quality of a system? So if you work in, with one unit and you improve the quality of that unit and the doctors in that unit and the nurses and whoever, and then you improve the quality of another facility and then another and another, are you going to achieve quality in the system at a large scale? I'm not sure. And I think it's hard to say so because then you have to get into the field of public policy. So if we try to talk about large scale, I think we better think as well of public policy and working with governments and uh, recognizing that the sum of individual qualities not necessarily leads to the quality of a system. I listened yesterday. Um, very carefully to the presentations of each of the approaches. But at some time, I started to think that uh, maybe, not because it was said yesterday, but just as a precaution, maybe sometimes we are using brands instead of generic terms. Let me put you an example. When we talked about accreditation, uh, we might be thinking of accreditation as JCI or um, Accreditation Canada or whatever, but accreditation may mean many things. And it has to do with standards, with compliance, with uh, audits. That's the generic set of interventions that we call it accreditation, but in another context, as I mentioned yesterday, like in my country. It's certification. What here in the States is accreditation in Mexico is certification. But we are talking about the same kind of intervention. So the other thing that was interesting yesterday was that uh, Alex's uh, research led, uh, led us to exactly the need not necessarily to use brand names, but to split the components of the interventions to understand what each intervention is, whatever we name it. So I think this is important again. Uh, so my, my fourth uh, perception and question is, should, should we use generic terms instead of uh, branding the interventions? Fifth, accreditation. Uh, I heard that for low-income countries, accreditation is unreachable because they are poor. Well, let me tell you what, what my experience was in my country 30 years ago when I started to work on quality improvement, and Mexico was under a major financial crisis. And everybody was saying, how come you come here and talk to us about improving quality where, when, when we don't have even the basic resources. And at the beginning, I, I didn't know how to answer that complaint or that challenge. But then I learned the answer, and it's still uh, useful. And my answer was, precisely because we don't have enough resources, we have 
to improve quality. Because otherwise, our patients will suffer even worse things. So when I hear that accreditation in poor countries uh, is unreachable, then uh, let me repeat what I've said when I was responsible for accreditation in Mexico a few years ago. And someone would say, uh, those standards are very high for us. We will never meet them. Take them off. And my answer was, no way. You know, because we, if we take them off, then you will never reach it. You might reach it in 10 years, but we know that we have to get there because it's important for our patients that you meet that. Perhaps it's going to be very hard, very, very hard. I know that. But if we take it off, we will never reach it. So we get into a vicious cycle. It's hard, so we take it off, so we never do any effort because it's hard, so we take it off and we never reach it. So I understand that uh, sometimes you cannot ask for the impossible, but you have to uh, somehow make it achievable, but at the same time, not very easy to achieve because otherwise you don't improve. So to me, accreditation should be uh, something that could be used, uh, adapted, not make it very easy, but of course not impossible. Uh, <clears throat> sixth, I'm concerned also that when we're talking about individual units, uh, and we are working with three, four, five, six, or ten units and uh, trying to improve the care of them. Uh, sometimes they are not enough uh, empowered to deal with the central bureaucracies. And my question is, are we working with central bureaucracies? Let me put you an, an example. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure you, you know that because you've been working with poor units. Uh, and uh, when they say, I don't have basic resources, and you turn your side to the other side, and you see the amount of resources that are wasted in the federal governments, for example, uh, or that they are buying things that are not necessary for this unit, and they send it because they have to send it, what is the power of the people inside the unit to deal with the bureaucracy, which sometimes don't understand, don't care about what these people is doing? So anyway, uh, again, that might have to do with the issue of systems and not only with dealing with individual units and individual efforts to improve quality uh, in, uh, uh, through individual approaches. Uh, last week, in a meeting where we were talking about the ASSIST project, uh, someone raised the point that I agreed very much with, the turnover when you're dealing with governments, turnover of officers. When uh, you convince someone that uh, it's important to improve the quality of care, and then uh, that people changes because of the political waves in any country. So how to deal with that? How to take that into consideration when you design a model for trying to uh, assess whether or not a, uh, an intervention works? Um, the intervention might work, but if there are external factors like this, sometimes uh, it's not easy to deal with, with them. Eight, again, when you're dealing with large scale, and you need uh, to talk about sustainability, is it enough to make the unit self-sustainable, or the set of units say self-sustainable, or is there a need to create local capacities to, to keep supporting those units while the external experts have to detach from the support? Ninth, we've been talking about training professionals. 
my concern sometimes is what are we doing to teach students of nursing medicine so by the time they get into the field they already know what we are talking about I know this might be out of reach of our interventions here but this is something that we should have also into consideration uh, knowing that it, it's sometimes better to teach earlier than later and uh, finally on my questions and perceptions uh, we were talking about methods bundles and scale how can we combine that in a design for um, making research on the combinations of these methods this bundles and the scale small or large scale well finally let me get into gaps and blind spots and uh, to me a gap is uh, uh, the distance between two dots and uh, so that implies that you know where you are and you know where you would like to be uh, so you know the two dots but sometimes there are blind spots things that you don't see in the radar it's, it's not present it's not a gap in a, in a way that you don't see the dot I know that uh, the, the, the difference might be very subtle but it might work so I, I'll go through 10 and that'll go very fast now uh, through 10 gaps or blind spots you may judge and you may classify them as either gap or a blind spot um, there are of course obvious gaps and they were mentioned yesterday and we've been dealing with this uh, the insufficient evidence on, on these methods but then I see a gap when we are talking about an intervention but we are not talking about the change triggers should there be methods to trigger change or is just enough to arrive to a unit and to implement something <clears throat> I don't know how you create the environment appropriate to uh, create the impulse to make a change then <clears throat> at the other extreme so you create the change environment how then you implement either quality assurance interventions or quality improvement interventions or both and then you get into sustainability and again how do we know that the strategies that we are using to sustain an effort are the best so again sustainability to me is not just wanting to create it but to know how to do it and and uh, I don't know if if we have the right answer always as, as to how to sustain an effort uh, <clears throat> three the scale do we know how I mean we know how to expand how to go into scale but again when when governments intervene uh, I think that uh, there is a gap there we, we don't know yet how to work well with governments directly the next gap we talk about continuity of care we we know how important it is for patients for people to have continuity of care and that might have to do with the creation of networks of services um, are we working with individual units or are we working with networks and and are we trying to improve the quality of the network which again has to do with the quality of a system we also heard yesterday about the what the how and the where and I would add to others the when and the who it's not the same let me go back to the government experience uh, but it could work also in any organization it's not the same to work with the government that is just starting than with a government that is just finishing its period uh, as it may be we, we all know that all organizations have a history and we know that 
the history of the organization influence the behavior of the organization. So are we taking into consideration the when of the interventions or not? And the who? Of course, we know about the role of leaders, the importance, the key importance of, of, of the role of leaders. Um, I didn't hear much about leadership yesterday and about understanding that role and how that role has to do with all the interventions that we are talking about. Next, communities. Someone mentioned that yesterday. How are communities involved in our interventions or not? Are we taking them into consideration? Should we? Training, uh, we were talking about training of professionals. I understand that sometime, sometime, the training involves management training. But Gary made a very important comment yesterday. Uh, we have, in most low and middle income countries, uh, well-prepared clinicians that because they are outstanding clinicians become the chief executive officer of the hospital or the director of the clinic with no training whatsoever on management. And then we expect that they understand what quality improvement is, how to change, what a strategy is. Uh, so I think that's a major gap uh, sometimes that we have to deal with. Another thing that was very obvious to me yesterday is the gap between the researchers and the implementers. And uh, Kater mentioned yesterday afternoon that we were talking about research um, after the fact. So implementation has been done. Now we are trying to make sense of what happened in the past, which is hard, and that's why Alex's uh, research is so uh, important and uh, admirable, because uh, what you did, trying to make sense of all the pieces that were all over the place, wasn't easy, I'm sure. So we might start thinking of uh, linking implementers and researchers uh, right away. Well, finally. There, there is something that I didn't hear as much as I would have liked. We are now concerned about patient-centeredness, and we talked about a bit yesterday. Some, somebody mentioned this. I think uh, it would be very important to have more indicators on how patient, patients are taken into consideration as active participants in their care. <clears throat> and not only patients, but also communities, again. So <clears throat> if we are going to talk about policies, how to create environments conducive to quality improvement, and to practice how to accelerate process progress, and about research, how to advance the field, maybe these uh, questions and gaps and blind spots might help to close the gaps, to see the spots, and to answer some questions. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>